Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of the GLOBE webinar series on the future of global governance. I am Carrie Otterburn of the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies, and I'll be your host and moderator today. Today, we are joined by Michael Manulek, who will be discussing his new book, Change in Global Environmental Politics, Temporal Focal Points, and the Reform of International Institutions, published this year by Cambridge University Press. Michael is assistant professor at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. His research focuses on international organizations, global environmental politics, nonproliferation, and multilateral diplomacy. From 2014 to 2019, he served as an analyst within the Government of Canada, chiefly representing the government on international proliferation security issues. Also joining us today as expert discussant is Professor Orfeo Fioritos. Rafael is Professor of Political Science at Temple University in Philadelphia. His research is focused on global economic governance, informal institutions, and transatlantic relations, and he is most known for his contributions to historical institutionalism in international relations. This year, Rafael also serves as the Chair of the International Political Economy Section of the International Studies Association. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation by Michael of approximately 25 minutes, and then we'll turn to our fail to kick off the discussion by offering some reflections and asking some questions to which Michael will have an opportunity to respond. Then we'll turn to questions from you, the audience. Feel free to send your questions to me at any point during the webinar by using the webinar Q&A function at the bottom of the webinar window. You should see a little button down at the bottom of your window and you can go ahead and use that to type out your question. We will collect your questions to share with the speakers during the audience Q&A following the presentations. Before we begin, just a few quick words about the GLOBE project. Funded by the European Commission's Horizon 2020 program, GLOBE seeks to understand the constraints and opportunities for the European Union in promoting its interests and values through global governance with specific attention to four key areas, trade and development, security and migration, climate change, and global finance. The project aims to identify the major roadblocks to effective and coherent global governance by multiple stakeholders in a multipolar world as well as to look ahead to 2030 and 2050 in order to equip policymakers with the tools they will need to deal with future challenges. On behalf of the GLOBE project, I would like to thank Michael and Orfeo for joining us today. And now it is my great pleasure to pass the floor to Michael. You have the floor. Thank you, Carrie, for uh, and, and to the GLOBE project more uh, generally. This is a really exciting forum, and I've watched a number of your webinars on YouTube and some of them live. And so it's it's great to great to be here and to be able to contribute and participate in this process. Um, also, would like to thank Orfeo for for agreeing to serve as the discussant for uh, for this. Um, I think I've I've told you, Orfeo, um, but back as a PhD student uh, in 2011, I picked up international organizations, and I read the article on uh, historical institutionalism and in, uh, in international relations, um, and it changed the trajectory of my graduate studies. I became interested in questions of institutional change and historical institutionalism more generally. And so um, in a lot of ways, that that article spurred a lot of what, what ended up producing this book. So it's it's kind of fitting, and in fact, a, a real honor to uh, to have you here as discussant uh, for, uh, for this presentation. Um, I'll do a few things uh, in this in this time, and then I'll be looking forward to uh, to your questions and your comments on the presentation and and, and on the book. Uh, so first, I'll provide a little bit of the backstory. Uh, I'm always interested in in some of the stories you had um, Duncan Snydell and Ken Abbott, and they talked about some of the history of how they collaborated together. I'm always interested in how uh, scholars the, the kind of the journey that scholars uh, take in, in uh, putting together their books and their analyses and so a little bit of the backstory to uh, to this and the puzzle that motivated this uh, this research program um, then I'll provide a an outline a bit of a thumbnail sketch of the theory uh, on temporal coordination problems temporal focal points um, and uh, and then I'll I'll touch uh, briefly on the the empirical side of the analysis, some of the um, some of the the nature of the empirical research that I undertook, and, and I'll walk through a few of the uh, a few of the conclusions in the history of global environmental governance that um, uh, that that provide the basis for uh, for the empirical aspects of the book. I'll highlight in conclusion a few of what I think uh, are some of the uh, some of the contributions of the book to uh, to international relations theory. Um, and one always hopes, or, and I certainly hope that the book is, uh, sets, uh, provides a kind of agenda setting function for some of the questions and, and perhaps for some, uh, some further research um, on, on these questions. 
Uh, so I'll start off uh, with the question of why institutional change uh, and why this uh, serves as a focus. Um, I think, uh, and Orfeo made this point uh, 10 years ago, but we in international relations are far better at explaining institutional continuity than we are at change. We're looking at uh, consistent problems of norms and uh, that, that govern cooperation and maintain an equilibrium in, in terms of international cooperations and modes of governance. Um, it's only more recently that we've begun to really take up this question of how institutions change and what motivates those changes. Um, and uh, this is actually a really important question in terms of global politics uh, in the world that we find right now. Um, I would argue that there are very few questions that are going to, to haunt and to preoccupy the international community as much as the question of institutional change in the coming decades. Uh, we've seen very significant shifts in the, in the uh, distribution of capabilities internationally. We've seen a massive diffusion of power. Uh, COP27, the, uh, the climate conference that's ongoing right now, uh, is showcasing the role of non-state actors and private sector actors and their significance, their relevance, their indispensability to, to tackling these problems. So uh, adjusting the international system and the sets of institutions to these challenges, uh, addressing these wicked problems of international cooperation, whether they're pandemics or climate change or uh, the surging uh, risks of, of nuclear proliferation. These are all the types of challenges that we're going to have to grapple with in the coming decades. Um, and if we cannot um, contribute to, to that process internationally as scholars of international organizations by helping to better understand what drives institutional change, then I think um, the, the period of international cooperation that has characterized the past 70 to 75 years is going to be seen as a golden age of, uh, of international cooperation uh, and perhaps an aberration in, in a history of, of that. And I think we as scholars have a very real role to play here uh, on, on these questions. Um, I, I tackled some of them as an analyst in the Canadian government pursuing institutional change within the Proliferation Security Initiative. And so I can appreciate both as a scholar the relevance of the contributions of, uh, of scholars in terms of understanding uh, what could potentially drive institutional change. And I would just uh, kind of underline this point as, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that this is a really important question. We scholars have a real opportunity to contribute concretely to solving international cooperation problems through helping to theorize and better understand the mechanisms that have facilitated institutional change. Um, so my background uh, is in international history, and so I began, uh, and this is where I get to the, the journey portion, um, I, I began essentially thinking that I was going to do a more straightforward history of global environmental governance, particularly focused on the landmark 1972 Stockholm Conference on the, the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment. Um, along the and I, I study various aspects of on it, uh, but along the way I discovered Orfeo's article on historical institutionalism and became uh, really interested in this question of institutional change, um, and I started analyzing that. Um, and when I looked at the record of change in UN environmental governance, there was a peculiar pattern um, that I saw in that record. Um, namely that uh, roughly one third or more than one third of uh, agreements of multilateral scope were concluded within two two-year phases of institutional hyperactivity. There was these bursts of activity at, very, at certain moments in time in which a huge amount of the international uh, governance architecture for global environmental cooperation uh, was born, uh, essentially, or changed radically. Uh, the first is in the early 1970s, roughly coinciding with the 72 Stockholm Conference. We get the Declaration on the Human Environment, which really is a fundamental text for um, uh, international environmental legal norms and a basis for international environmental law, which is still very much in development. We get the Stockholm Action Plan, which was a set of more than 100 recommendations on international cooperation on environmental questions. We get the creation of the UN Environment Program. We also get five environmental conventions can, uh, agreed upon within within that two-year phase. Uh, we get the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species, Flora and Fauna. We get the London Dumping Convention that had to do with dumping of wastes in the ocean at sea. We get the World Heritage Convention. We get the Ramsar Convention on wetlands. We get the Marine Pollution Convention. All of these um, clustered in this, in this period of, of real productivity and dynamism in global environmental governance. Then 20 years later, roughly coinciding with the Rio uh, Earth Summit, we get the Rio Declaration, which built off of the, the Stockholm Declaration. We get Agenda 21, another action plan. We get the creation of the Commission on Sustainable Development. We, of course, get the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. We get the Biodiversity Convention. We get the Desertification Convention in 94. And we get the Forest Principles, which set out a, a basis for cooperation in the preservation of forests. 
Um, and so we get these, these two uh, phases of, of real concentrated activity, and we see um, a, a real uh, significant shift in, in global environmental governance in this period. Now, from a pure rational choice perspective, this pattern makes no sense. Unless you subscribe to the view that, um, that all of these, we'll take the 1970s, for example, that all of these international problems that though related in kind of in the broad environmental sphere, they're all very distinct areas of international uh, uh, cooperation. Whether if you, unless you subscribe to the view that the trade of endangered species, uh, it, it tends to correlate very closely with the worsening of dumping, dumping of wastes at sea, which correlates very closely with a, a significant worsening of world heritage or the destruction of world heritage sites, which is also correlated with wetland and the destruction of wetlands. Um, unless you believe that all of those things are very tightly correlated, um, something else must be driving a, a this, this burst of cooperation. There must be a reason why this is coinciding all at once. And if you adopt the view that, that something must be spurring all of these related but, but very distinct areas of international cooperation to change all at the same time or all at roughly the same time, um, then you must believe that the incentives that motivated the institutional changes that we see in the 1970s and also that we see in the 1990s, the incentives to address all of those issues accumulated prior to the 1970s. There must be something that was creating, um, really, these are a set of problems that, um, that were produced by industrialization. There was talk and discussion of these issues all through you know, the late 1950s and through the early 1960s and even into the early 1970s, but the international community was unable to, uh, to take action on these issues, unable to coordinate, reach a coordination of expectations around uh, the types of, um, uh, the types of um, actions that would be needed to, to address these issues on a broad scale. Um, <clears throat> So it um, so this brought me to to uh, to begin to look at uh, coordination issues um, in uh, with uh, through a temporal lens basically. Uh, so we have these accumulating incentives for institutional changes in a broad array of institutional areas, um, and so the question really becomes: in the presence of available joint gains, in the presence of incentives to cooperate in all of these areas, what what explains the absence of change before those periods? Um, so explaining those bursts of activity, in other words, had uh, had a lot to do with explaining what had happened, what had preceded those jumps in activity. And so my analysis uh, became as interested in what was happening at those times, but it also became just as interested in what was not happening prior to those periods in time. And really what we end up seeing are, are two factors that, um, that shaped or made change very difficult. And these are formed the basis for the temporal coordination problems that prevented concerted international action on all of these issues prior to, um, prior to the period when they all clustered. Uh, first of which um, is uh, what I theorize as exogenous shifts. So in international relations and, and in theorizing institutional change, um, IR scholars, I think, had an unhelpful uh, emphasis on exogenous shocks as a driver of large scale institutional change. These could spur critical junctures and major institutional change. One of the benefits of exogenous shocks is not only do you see a nonlinear change in the problem structure, creating incentives for alterations to cooperative arrangements, but you also have a very conspicuous moment in time where there's an international crisis that is associated with those exogenous shocks. Basically they're shocking, which spurs or moves international actors to coordinate. And so this is why you see institutional change so closely associated with exogenous shocks in many instances. The problem is that exogenous shocks are relatively rare. Things like wars and big economic crises are actually relatively uncommon in the international system. Yet the conditions that create incentives for cooperation actually uh, typically evolve more gradually. We see power, power transition in the international system or a diffusion of power uh, occurring year after year. If we look at the global environmental space, we see things like wetlands worsening progressively. It's very seldom that you see all of these dispersed issues worsening all, uh, you know, worsening in, in an exogenous shock pattern. But things like world heritage, the destruction of world heritage, and the need to protect world heritage um, evolves progressively over time. It gets worse and worse and worse. Um, but in, in effect, it doesn't have that shocking coordination point that is associated with exogenous shocks. Things just get progressively worse and worse and worse, which is really what we're seeing with climate change uh, as, as another example of this. We're, we're boiling the frog progressively, uh, but we don't have that, that mechanism to spur coordination. 
The other aspect of it, lacking a clear coordination point as exogenous conditions continue to change progressively, we have the very high transaction costs that are associated with altering institutional arrangements or creating uh, new institutions to tackle these types of issues. Um, and so we see a, a consistent absence of political and analytical investments for long periods of time. Very little is happening for, for substantial amounts of time. Uh, and then uh, and, until actors reach a convergence of expectations in which they expect others to expect to be expected to behave in a certain manner, to take these institutional problems seriously and negotiate in a concerted manner. And once they do that, they're able to make those political and analytical investments, uh, but, but it's very hard to do unless there's that expectation. And I, I would see this very often in government where you're constantly strapped for resources, even in, well, you know, I worked in the Canadian government, relatively well resourced in the international scheme of things, but to try to get people's attention to institutional problems some institution because you have identified a problem is very hard you have to have some sort of a mechanism that that uh, brings actors to concert their expectation at a certain moment in time and so absent that type of coordination that temporal coordination issue a lot of times incentives can, can accumulate for years for decades at a time but there's no capacity to reach a convergence of expectations in time that allows actors to uh, to, uh, to to tackle these institutional problems in a concerted way so I began to think um, about um, um, uh, temporal focal points, which is where, um, which tends to get most of the attention within this analysis, but it's the answer to the temporal coordination problem in a sense. Um, in Thomas Schelling's um, The Strategy of Conflict, he uh, provides a really uh, compelling example in which he asked his students how they might expect to meet somebody in New York City if they were not able to communicate with them. Uh, clearly, they didn't have cell phones at the time uh, when he was asking his students, but there was no mechanism for them to coordinate. But a large number of his students were actually able to coordinate their expectations on the information booth at Grand Central Station at New uh, and so this is how students would, act, uh, would, um, uh, would, would coordinate with somebody that they couldn't communicate with. Um, the point that Schelling is making in that a context of multiple equilibria, for example, meeting someone in New York City, you could meet them in countless number of places. Um, but places, locations that had conspicuousness or prominence relative to others served as an irresistible point of focus for those actors. Now, this has often been applied to analysis of negotiations, where you can have an agreement concept that is prominent relative to the others, and it becomes an irresistible, almost develops a gravitational pull that leads actors toward reaching agreement uh, in the context of that focal point, even though there are a whole range of different reformulations and recombinations of agreements that, that could have potentially been, uh, been, uh, been agreed upon. But the focal point has great power. Um, thinking about Schelling's analysis, I wondered if there were uh, if there could be a temporal variant of this or a temporal analog to Schelling's focal points in which prominent moments in time have a pull that can facilitate coordination uh, in, in, in situations where incentives accumulate, uh, uh, accumulate gradually. And so, um, and theoretically, of course, th this is also a multiple equilibrium problem. They could coordinate at any point in time, but these, these prominent moments in time have, uh, have, um, have a pull. Um, temporal focal points in, in my analysis have three um, important characteristics. First of all, they're discrete moments in time. It's clear, relatively clear when actors can act within the ambit of a focal time frame. There's a relative definition to, to that temporal time frame in which actors can act uh, in, in that, which enables coordination. Uh, second of all, they're unique in that they cannot, they're not common, they do not arise often, otherwise they wouldn't have the coordinated, the, the, coordinated uh, the, the power to coordinate in the same way that they would if they, if they, if they didn't have that pull. And finally, they're conspicuous. I use the example in the book as a flare fired into the night sky. Temporal focal points are the obvious time to take action on these issues um, in, in, in international governance. Um, so common examples of these focal points, anniversaries are very popular in international politics. We see them used very frequently uh, to facilitate that. We have symbolic dates, something like the millennium, for example, provided the, the impetus for the millennium development goals, for example, where uh, international development cooperation uh, was, uh, was advanced by, uh, by the presence of these goals. We also have demonstration effects, which are largely symbolic crises that, are not, that should not be considered exogenous shocks. They do not represent a real change in the incentive structure of actors, but there's something symbolic 
almost like the falling of a bridge, highlights the need to change to tackle infrastructure problems in the city more generally. But that falling of the bridge is not the problem itself. It's just what, what spurred actors, provided a coordination point for actors to, uh, to, to uh, coordinate their expectations. But the incentives pre predated the, the, the falling of the bridge or, uh, or the, uh, the coordination point that, that, uh, that is unique and highly conspicuous in terms of uh, facilitating or tackling institutional problems. Um, and so um, <clears throat> these uh, temporal focal points are very important because they can allow actors to marshal their scarce political and analytical resources to assess. They, can, they establish um, uh, new departments. They establish depart interdepartmental committees. They conduct uh, analyses and investments uh, in, uh, in, in studies of institutional problems. They begin to engage their, their networks. They event, uh, begin to invest political capital. Um, and all of these things can lead to nonlinear changes in the preferences of states um, in, at, in a fundamental level. Um, uh, and also to, uh, they can also provide a focus for the mobilization of latent coalitions that can again affect the, um, the balance of interests in, in tackling a particular institutional problem. So they can lead to very sudden shifts in the international context to realize the accumulated incentives that had been uh, building up over time through a series of exogenous shifts within the international problem structure, but the lack of a coordination point, temporal focal points provide that coordination point that allow actors to essentially capitalize on unrealized incentives. Um, and again, for, for, from a rational choice perspective, that the existence of these incentives uh, is fundamentally irrational because uh, uh, failing to capitalize on incentives soon after they arise um, is, is irrational. It's, it's akin to opting uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, Pareto inferior agreements in a negotiating context. And so they create the, um, these uh, temporal focal points provide a real impetus for realizing significant institutional change. Um, so I conducted in order to, uh, to to test the theory to see whether whether the the concept of temporal focal points and the conceptualization of uh, temporal coordination problems provided a persuasive explanation for uh, that strange clustering of institutional um, uh, of institutional change that I observed at the at the beginning of my analysis. I conducted a very extensive uh, archival analysis, and uh, for those that that maybe will. Um, uh, venture beyond the the theoretical chapters. I really invite you because those the empirical chapters in the book really were a labor of love uh, for for me. Um, I enjoyed putting those stories together. I enjoyed the the personalities and the actors and the impulses uh, and the complexity of international history. And so uh, so I conducted uh, an extensive archival analysis. I uh, consulted eight archives in five countries, uh, literally tens of thousands of pages of diplomatic documents surrounding these. I looked at the Canadian documents, of course, the British documents, the American documents, the Swedish documents. I got Brazilian documents. I got UN Secretariat documents and the Secretariat of the Conferences documents. So I was really attacking the Stockholm uh, Conference and the Rio Conference uh, and all of the other uh, um, institutional um, uh, kind of areas of cooperation in a really from multiple different angles uh, to really get an authoritative analysis. And I think uh, it stands up as, as one of the, the most complete treatments, uh, certainly the most extensive archival treatment uh, of this uh, area of international cooperation that, that, as far as I know, is available in the literature. Um, in addition to the archival piece, I conduct an extensive program of interviews. Uh, I got to interview many of the, the leading actors, uh, Maura Strong, the Secretary General of the Stockholm and the Rio Summit, the first Executive Director of the UN Environment Program, uh, uh, Gro uh, Highland Brundtland, the, uh, the, the head of the Brundtland Commission, um, uh, Elizabeth Dowdswell, a later uh, UN UNEP Executive Director in the early 1990s, Jim McNeil, who essentially wrote our common uh, future, the Brundtland Report, uh, in close collaboration, Tommy Coe, the, uh, the, the head of the uh, preparatory uh, process for the Rio summit. Uh, so quite a, quite a pretty extensive list of interviews. I spoke to, to most of the major players uh, at, at many of these events uh, to provide a real, uh, to provide detail and texture and sometimes some colorful quotes uh, that, that I included in the book about, uh, about, the, uh, about what was really driving cooperation. 
Um, I looked at pretty much the whole period, really from the, the kind of the early 1960s uh, up until uh, the present time, essentially, when I was uh, concluding writing the book around 2020 uh, of uh, major, the major events. Um, the, the chapters are really centered on um, first the 1972 Stockholm Conference provides an anchor for the first chapter, but really it looks at 1963 all the way till 1972. Then I look at um, the UN session of a special character, the UNEP session of a special character uh, in 1982, but the period really, the chapter really focuses on the period after Stockholm all the way up until up until that 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 summit uh, or that that international meeting where institutional change was was pursued, but the lack of incentives, the lack of real changes and external conditions failed to motivate significant institutional change. So again, we're getting variation on the dependent variable uh, in the in the in my analysis. Um, then I look at the Brundtland Commission, really running from uh, 1984 to 1987, looking at that whole that whole period. And in the case of Brundtland, we have a lot of we we do have major changes owing to the third world debt crisis, in particular, creating a series of environmental problems in the developing world. This really motivated the concept of sustainable development, which the Brundtland Commission popularized. Uh, but um, the uh, a failure to have a clear, discrete time frame to in which uh, expectations could converge really created an um, uh, an obstacle to realizing significant institutional change in 1987 when the Brundtland Commission uh, released its landmark report. Uh, then I look at the Rio Earth Summit in some detail in 1992. And again, we see the same incentives effectively that were present in 1987, still present in 1982 to realize change. But what we have is, is uh, what emerges as a clear uh, temporal focal point, a coordination point around expectations can converge and we get nonlinear institutional change, roughly in line with what was recommended by the Brentland Commission five years earlier. Um, and then uh, I, added on, I added on a chapter, uh, which was not part of the original, uh, uh, the original work, but uh, looking at the period since uh, the Rio Earth Summit, uh, uh, covering the um, some of the efforts to alter or reform the UN Environment Program, uh, but also looking at the World Summit on Sustainable Development in 2002 in Johannesburg, uh, and then uh, then subsequently the Rio Plus 20 Summit, where we do see some significant institutional change. So we get a good amount of variation in 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 the presence of these conditions internationally uh, through uh, through the empirical uh, analysis. Um, in 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 the book, um, I guess uh, I'll I'll try to wrap up in the next. I, I realize this has taken more time than uh, than I than I anticipated. Um, but uh, I I wanted to highlight a couple of what I see as some of the theoretical takeaways uh, from the book, and happy to to delve a bit more. I know that I've spoken a lot more theory than uh, than I have empirics here. Happy to elaborate on any of those as as uh, we go forward. Um, but some of the some of the takeaways I think uh, theoretically. Uh, looking at the implications of exogenous shifts, as I say, we some I think we sometimes have uh, an excessive emphasis on exogenous shocks as drivers of institutional change, but the implications of exogenous shifts are every part as, as significant uh, to uh, creating problem structures that need to be addressed through institutional change. And so understanding the implications and uh, perhaps dissecting some of the implications of exogenous shifts, I think is, is very important. Um, the temporal coordination dilemmas, I think are, uh, well, temporal focal points, I think get more of the, uh, more of the emphasis. Temporal coordination dilemmas are really at the core of what temporal focal points solve. Uh, and so understanding the nature of those temporal coordination problems and helping to enrich our understanding of how uh, temporal factors play in international relations as coordination problems, I think is very important. And so uh, unpacking those uh, those temporal coordination dilemmas, which I think perhaps I just scratched the surface on uh, in the book is, uh, is central. Uh, temporal focal points uh, kind of provide a focus for the book. Uh, and they really are a nice complement to exogenous shocks and explaining how when we have exogenous shifts, how we realize nonlinear institutional change is significant institutional change. Um, and then I say theoretical takeaways, but I hope that there will be an empirical takeaway for the book as well in terms of understanding our how our systems of global environmental governance so important these days, uh, I would I would argue, uh, are have evolved over time and how we've um, how we got the structures that we did and what have been the drivers of their change. Uh, internationally, I'd say um, some of the some of the major um, takeaways is that is that um, the uh, the mechanisms that facilitate institutional change really are 
uh, complex. There are many actors and we need to uh, have greater emphasis, not just on what a couple of major actors, China and the United States, for example, are um, where they stand on a particular institutional problem. We, we can't focus on just a couple of trees, but we have to understand how broad patterns of cooperation uh, are, are affecting the, the flows and the development of global uh, global governance more generally, um, and then uh, perhaps widen our lens to understand how uh, activities within states, activities um, uh, that, that cut across the states, non-state actors, and the uh, ability of actors to, to reach a convergence of expectation at discrete moments in time really has an effect on our ability to, to recognize change. Um, a key point is that is that it's not just the incentives, the incentives are a necessary, the existence of incentives to alter institutional arrangements are a necessary condition to, uh, to realizing significant institutional change, but they're not a sufficient condition. You need that coordination aspect. And I think that that is one of the pieces that has been missing in our analysis so far. And that's one of the points I try to uh, bring out in the book. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael, for this very um, clear, I think, um, overview of the central theories that you're working with and some of your main findings. Um, I would like to pass the floor now to our FAO to kick off today's discussion, but I'd also like to remind the audience that the Q&A will begin pretty soon. So if you can start reflecting on what you might wanna ask, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of the webinar window to send in those questions. And now we turn to you, our FAO. Thank you very much, Carrie, and thank you very much, Michael, for sharing your book and giving this giving us all a chance to take it in here in half an hour. It is an incredible book. It's a superb book, really, that covers really novel theory, brings forward, the, I think, the institutional research agenda very significantly, and it offers, just as you said, incredibly deep and rich empirical studies. You you ended your presentation by saying, you know, you hope to add something to to a literature where certain elements had been missing. And I think this book accomplishes that. It, I think, and, and you started off your presentation by thanking me for a short article that I wrote a while back and for having inspired you to look into some of these things. I, I think that probably gives my work a little bit more credit than it deserves. But one thing that I hoped to achieve in that piece was to say that, look, there's elements of research that we have sort of sidelined a little bit within the institutionalist research agenda. You write about a period in the 1970s which is a period where we have a lot of institutional activity in global governance. And also at the same time, there emerges deep and new institutional traditions of research. And so theoretical advances are taking place at the same time. What struck me was that all of that research is based on secondary material. We basically were theorizing and developing institutional theory without really knowing what the primary archive was telling us or what it could reveal about the motivations and behavior of states. And I think your, you know, your book is now, you know, I think the first book looking at the environment that takes, you know, takes us back to that period when people were theorizing international cooperation and really tell us, you know, in some ways what we get right and what we, you know, where we have some uh, some area for progress, some areas for improvement. So I think it's a, it is a really significant uh, achievement and I hope all, all your listeners here today We'll pick up the book very soon, and I think they will share my um, my very positive assessment of the book. And let me say a couple of words: one about theory, and then uh, something about methods, and very quickly about the empirics. Really, just a couple of questions that, if you had had more time, I'd you know encourage you to sort of highlight for those that might be hearing about this book for for the first time. The basic argument is that. Um, temporal moments. There are moments in time that serve as a kind of gravitational pull. So if we have an anniversary, for example, and um, that might create the opportunities or help uh, you know, policymakers overcome uh, the difficulties that they've confronted in the past. Uh, that seems at this point intuitive to us uh, because Michael has articulated the reasons for why this is important, but it's not something that we had really thought about very significantly before him. And so I think that is really the core message here. It, and I think you did a wonderful job detailing it here uh, earlier. So I think that's the core message that we all want to, to keep in mind here. What it allows you to do is to make contributions to multiple literatures. And also in some ways, even though you have this expert analysis in chapter two of different traditions, it allows you to sort of pinpoint where some relative strengths and weaknesses are. And you'd show us a little bit later on that um, these temporal focal moments, they sort of, you know, serve as a organizing device that help policymakers overcome or let's say maybe assume additional transaction costs and, and solve the kind of problems that are in front of them. At the same time, of course, we know that, you know, anniversaries happen, they come and go, and some are more memorable than others. 
And so some, uh, some, you know, 1972 becomes a big one, 1992 becomes a big one, but there are other moments that you also highlight where, you know, that were not quite as memorable in, in, in retrospect. So one question that I would have for you is, you know, over time, you begin in the 1970s, over time, we have added a lot more institutions. The institutional environment has become denser so that in 1972, what might be an opportunity for innovation looks very different than 1992 and certainly much different today in, in 2022. So I'm curious how you make sense out of the denser institutional environment and whether that means the temporal focal becomes more important. And therefore, uh, I guess the, the, the follow-up question would be, what role policymakers play in that process and how they themselves make sense out of these kind of temporal focal moments? In, you know, so that's a question both about the relative importance of institutions and the density of institutions and a question about agency in that context. This is a big book, so I want to, you know, uh, highlight the uh, methodological contributions that you're making. This is a multi-method project. Michael mentioned some of the interviews is conducted. There are more than 20 interviews here. There's a high-level elite interviews um, that are beautifully integrated in the project. And, you know, there are some choice quotes here that we could have picked up and you know, really feast on in some respects. And the, the, but you also have really uh, excellent uh, source material from, from archives, the archives that you mentioned. I guess my question for you would be, can you tell us a little bit more about how that journey of research helped you not so only refine your theory, but maybe alter your interpretation of how the literature around the institutions was trying to make sense out of the world that you now know up close much better. In other words, was it just like a theory testing exercise? Or was it really more a process by which you refined your theory, changed your theory, amended your theory? I'd be curious to hear how the process itself and the methodological choices um, that you made uh, impacted the final conclusions of the project. Finally, very briefly, um, uh, on the empirics. You know, you and I, you know, we don't have time to dwell on on uh, on these excellent uh, chapters on Stockholm, Nairobi, and the Rio conferences. As you said, these are labors of love, and you know, and they really deserve much more attention here than, than I get a chance to to speak about them. And um, we are now at COP twenty seven. Um, you know, several, you know, a couple of decades away from the period that you have covered, and you, the book sort of ends on a relatively positive note suggesting that maybe, you know, now we're at one moment in time that, you know, we have to seize the chance to really uh, address climate change. And you point to some political leaders that might you know, change it. Um, but there are a lot of people that also are quite skeptical that this is the moment where we're going to be able to overcome um, the challenges that confront the world when it comes to climate change. Just good, Secretary Guterres said the other day that we're on the highway to hell, for example. What is it from, what do you take away from your study when you sort of try to look at the present a little bit into the near future? You think about the Paris Agreement that for example, have this you know, built in global stock taking element to it, right? That every five years we're supposed to reassess where we are. Have they learned from the processes that you have studied? And what would you tell researchers to be on the lookout for if we were to sort of identify their relative importance of temporal focal points or their relative, you know, the, their absence. So, so as researchers, what should we be keeping an eye out for today as the COP27 is going on, but also in the near future? Those are the kind of questions that I'd be, you know, raising if we had a, a chance over a cup of coffee. And, you know, I would look forward to, to hearing your answers. I don't expect to hear all the answers today because there are others that want to get online and ask them your question. But congratulations again, Michael. This is a fantastic book and I'll be recommending it to, to colleagues and students to like for a long time to come. We can turn directly to you, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Uh, some really good and challenging questions. I think um, one of the one of the aspects of, of uh, the theory that that is uh, that I really didn't get the chance to build on in the presentation, but uh, but uh, raises in your point is the the relationship and the role of agency in in all of this, and how do you realize focal points, especially once you get uh, a greater density of international cooperation, and that that does present a real challenge for uh, uh, for the uh, arrival of, of temporal focal points, in the sense that um, temporal focal points need to be unique, and there need there can't be. A, a set of uh, potential alternative temporal foci, uh, focal points that uh, are, are potential moments along the the temporal continuum that stand out as cons uh, as as conspicuous as as temporal focal points, and so this can create a real a real challenge for coordination within the international system. Um, in um, 
in my earlier article on, on the subject, I, I uh, put a lot of emphasis on the exogenous origins of, of temporal focal points, that they need to be something out there in the environment that, uh, like an anniversary, that's not directly in the control of any actors. Um, in the book, I, I, I come off that just a little bit and open up a little bit more space than I did in the article for the role of agency. Um, so there needs to be something that's out there in the environment, but no temporal focal point uh, is, is completely uh, uh, completely exogenous. There's always uh, a mixture of some aspect of, of endogeneity in that. Um, yet still, um, they, they have to have uh, a, a fundamental grounding in order to be a temporal focal point rather than some kind of an exogenous construction. Um, and so one of the one of the points, and I, I took this up, I, I released uh, two articles um, that, that try to develop some of the, the potential policy implications of this uh, for how actors can, can seek to perhaps uh, create conditions for the rise of a temporal focal point, even though they cannot create a temporal focal point. They can perhaps um, take actions that, that uh, make it more likely that a temporal focal point is going to uh, going to arise. Um, and that is um, uh, looking at, so uh, I, I, one of the articles for Global Policy looks at the UN uh, Summit of the Future that's now scheduled for 2024. Um, and being very conscious about keeping the agenda relatively clear of potential. So they, they set it up in UN, the UN's high level week in New York during the General Assembly, when leaders are going to be coming to, to focus on a range of different issues. If you're going to be considering far reaching changes to the fundamental institutional architecture of the United Nations, leaders need to be coming to New York um, focused on that issue and making the, the major political and analytical investments on that issue. So in a way, uh, trying to keep the institutional landscape as um, uh, and, and, and augment the both the conspicuousness and the uniqueness of that of that focal point in a very deliberate way helps to create uh, uh, create conditions that are more conducive to to the arrival of a temporal focal point. Um, having said that, the these um, one of the things I think that comes through very clearly in the book is that uh, temporal focal points cannot be created by any actor. They cannot be just produced by a powerful actor within the international system. There's an emergent uh, quality to this, uh, where international actors see a focal point and they orient their behavior in a very decentralized way around that focal point. And so in a way, they um, they they exhibit, exhibit characteristics that are, um, a, as, a, as a collective, that are distinct from the individual characteristics of actors. And so in a way, they resemble uh, flocks of birds or schools of fish behaving in a very decentralized way. And no one actor can create that coordination point. It's, it's a social emergent phenomenon uh, in, in a sense that that leads all of these actors to uh, to make those types of political and analytical investments. So there's a there's a complex I think a complex dance between structure and agency that I try to that I try to work through in the book. But it's something that uh, um, that uh, that that definitely, especially as the institutional environment becomes more uh, more dense, as you say, uh, becomes a real challenge. Um, <clears throat> Methodologically, the archival uh, process was uh, was um, uh, was very uh, it was as I say very extensive. I very much enjoy reading the, the the dispatches by diplomats back and forth, the snide comments about other leaders and diplomats that uh, that became famous in WikiLeaks types of things. Uh, they, they, but but diplomats have been doing this for decades um, uh, with these things and the gossip that goes on. Um, but but they, it really did uh, I think provide a a basis for for theory testing because. I, I don't just look at, there's a kind of dual approach that I employ in the book that, that looks at the level of comparative statics, essentially looking at the presence of incentives and temporal focal points and anticipating that in the uh, in the presence of both of these conditions, we would expect to see institutional change. So I can test at that level. But then I undertake a process tracing analysis that um, that analyzes whether we see what I call uh, temporal pacing. Essentially, actors are uh, pacing their political analytical investments, their bargaining behavior in relation to some focal point in time that is a shared focal point. And so I conduct that analysis and I test that analysis through uh, the, the archival assessment. Um, I have to say that, that part of a lot of that, I had the benefit of completing this project uh, as a part of my, my doctoral research and then going off into spending five years in government where I worked on these issues as a policy practitioner. And so a lot of the analysis as I rewrote the book for publication actually benefited from my experience in government, understanding the way bureaucracy is, understanding the way that senior management in your department, unless it's something that's specifically asked for, or there's some external stimuli that uh, that facilitates that they're not they they just don't find the time to ever read briefing notes that you that you send up, even though you're, you know, you're this 
hire a scholar that's interested in you know historical institutionalism and the insights of Orfeo Fioretos, and you're writing these memos, and you find out that two months later your your uh, your assistant deputy minister or whatever uh, hasn't read actually read the briefing note because they're too busy with more urgent and pressing issues. Um, those kinds of things definitely definitely factor in, and and um, and I think uh, uh, kind of fueled the emphasis on on those externals. Um, and then just in terms of, of uh, COP and 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 uh, some of the uh, some of the issues that we're we're grappling with now, um, I, I had hoped uh, that that we perhaps were emerging to a, a, a situation where where we could be on the climate front, um, uh, pr uh, proceeding toward a, some kind of a temporal focal point that that drove uh, from the the arrival of the Biden administration changes in U.S. policy on climate and so on. Um, but um, uh, part of the uh, I think the war in uh, the war in Ukraine is uh, is uh, really kind of sidelined this. It's COP 27 is far less conspicuous than uh, than some of the other other COPs, and so this may create uh, some real some real difficulties in in realizing significant institutional change uh, or uh, major progress on the the climate file. And so um, the uh, the convergence of expectations that I called for perhaps to see a nonlinear increase in the level of climate ambition to meet the uh, the types of gaps that we see in the uh, that were publicized in the UN Environment Program's uh, emissions gap report that was just recently published. Um, uh, it's uh, I, I think we're going to face some real challenges at least in the short run to uh, to realize uh, those significant institutional changes. Some of the some of the after effects of the war in Ukraine are going to make the uh, not and, and uh, you know as well as the the inflationary pressures that many countries are experiencing right now are going to make the types of financing that might allow a uh, a real breakthrough on on adaptation on loss and damage and so on uh, perhaps a, a, a bit more of a challenge. Uh, but I'll be watching with with real great interest, uh, including the midterm elections that are ongoing today and the implications of that for for what ends up happening uh, at uh, at COP this time. Thank you. We have a few questions from the audience. Uh, might as well just jump right into these with the time that we have left. So first, we have a question on the immediate period after a cluster of activity. Um, are there diminished expectations about the prospects for institution building or change? Is there an awareness of less agency or like the idea that the moment has passed? Um, and alongside that, are, are, are actors really aware in the moment of what is going on? Do they feel a need to seize this moment? Uh, and could you also, um, in the next question, elaborate on the role of civil society in helping to create temporal focal points and how states might react to these efforts? And sort of relatedly, you started off noting the rise of non-state actors and institutional change. And do you think that these shifts and focal points work in a similar way going forward with this greater diversity and number of actors um, involved in regulation and governance? So let's start off with those questions um, and then we'll see if we have time for some more. Uh, yeah, thank you for the uh, the excellent questions, Carrie. Uh, so, in the immediate period, uh, there there often is an exhale. I think there's, as part of the definition of temporal focal points, is that they're they're discrete moments in time. So there is a consciousness that that kind of the window is closed, and oftentimes there's a real race to to kind of get agreements, as it were, under the wire. Um, and within the context, we look at the biodiversity negotiations, for example, in 1992, and there was a real effort, you know, round the clock negotiations, trying to salvage talks. Uh, of course, theoretically, these talks could just continue. Actors could schedule another meeting. Uh, but there was a sense that there is a real focus on that time and that this is the window that this has to happen. Um, that that impetus quickly dissipates. And, and sometimes there's there's a bit of a, a bit of an after effect on on that. Um, of course, theoretically, that that kind of activity shouldn't shouldn't happen, at least from a rationalist perspective, because there should be equal attention to incentives that are accumulating in perhaps other spheres of institutional activity, uh, including in the environment space that that uh, could not be addressed within that within that uh, period of time. Um, and so um, the, there is a real, I think, a real sense, uh, and that that there's a moment that can be seized here, and that creates an opening for political entrepreneurs and institutional entrepreneurs of all stripes to bring forward their their ideas, and that's very much what we saw in at Stockholm, where um, uh, you know you have the. Um, the IUCN, the different scientific unions, uh, seeing an opportunity here and trying to push forward their own institutional ideas and seeing if there's an opportunity or a possibility that, uh, that, that this is something that governments can seize upon and uh, so that they can take advantage of that, uh, that opportunity structure. Um, 
In terms of civil society, civil society is very important. And I think it's one of the things that comes out in the book. And actually, I only wish that that it could come out more. I think one of the challenges is sometimes uh, the the kind of the the dispersed activities of civil society actors is uh, can be a little harder to observe and a little harder to document. Uh, but it's something that um, that that even reading back through the chapters, um, I think is is one of the key elements of the book. But I I read the chapters on. Mm, I kind of wish that I I'd gotten a bit more of that. Maybe gotten into some of the NGOs archives and taking a look at those documents to do that. But, you know, the chapters are already relatively long. And so, uh, so there's, there are kind of choices that need to be made in these things. But, but I think that that's, they're, they're really important actors in increasing the conspicuousness of temporal focal points. Um, as I said before, no actor, no one actor, even the most powerful actors within the international system can create temporal focal points. They can't create that that emergent phenomenon that 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 can tends to emerge around a temporal focal point, uh, but they certainly can help increase the salience and the significance and the the conspicuousness of of a date and try to uh, try to kind of create the the social dynamics that end up uh, the, the that gravitational pull that end up leading to uh, the kinds of political and analytical investments that end up leading to nonlinear changes in the preferences of major international actors and ultimately result in institutional change. Um, with the with the rise of, of uh, more and more non-state actors, I I mean as as international activities become uh, become more dense and and, and uh, more active, it can become more challenging uh, to realize a uh, a temporal convergence of expectations. It's almost uh, logical that in institutional context, for example, where you know composed of a small number of like-minded states, the coordination challenges are are less than they are in in a world where like the UN environment space, which which is what makes this a really tough case for uh, for the analysis, where you have a large diversity of actors uh, and that uh, with a, a widely divergent preferences, and so the coordination of of expectations among such a wide large number of diverse actors becomes a real challenge institutionally. Right, thank you. So we have a couple other questions. Um, we have one wondering about the the symbolic dates and the you called them demonstration effects, I believe. Um, about these demonstration effects, who who to whom do these need to be meaningful and symbolic? Um, and you you mentioned just now that there's no one person or one group that could make these appear, but you said um, increasing salience mobilization around them is possible. Um, what can weaker and more vulnerable actors do to sort of make these focal points more salient, more, I guess, powerful actors that maybe are not noticing them or not picking up on the cues? Uh, and then I also have another question about, um, about in general, um, cross issue areas. So you notice these two, uh, er these two focal points for environmental cooperation. Um, do you see that these types of focal points have like a cross issue component? Do you see greater periods of activity on other types of issues? Are they really specific to sort of environmental cooperation, or could it just be more generally periods of greater international cooperation activity um, occurring around these time periods? And then finally. We have a sort of future looking question. Um, just wondering in your opinion, with your expertise, how likely could we meet the sustainable development goals? So we can try uh, to answer that one as well. Look into the future a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some really, and uh, another round of uh, good, uh, good questions. Um, so a little bit on the symbolic dates. Um, so I gave the example of the millennium uh, as as a as a date of great international significance. Sometimes religious dates can uh, can can play into certain certain contexts as being highly salient uh, in in um, in international uh, relations. So those can matter. Um, so the, really, it depends on on just whether the date comes across as unique and highly conspicuous in in a, in a particular context, and really anything, because the point is not that the date itself has any meaning whatsoever in terms of the incentives of actors. This is a critical, critical point. Um, it, the date is frankly an arbitrary factor. Um, the, the importance of the date is just that it provides a coordination point for actors. Um, demonstration effects are are similar. Essentially, uh, you've got uh, some sort of development. The Stockholm Conference 
conference was actually one of these. Of course, there wasn't uh, an anniversary in, at Stockholm because it was the first major UN environmental conference, but there ended up being a series of small environmental disasters, the sinking of the Torrey Canyon super, counter, uh, super tanker, um, uh, near the UK, uh, a, a blaze on the Cuyahoga River in Ohio, a number of different environmental um, uh, uh, disasters that just happened to fall in the in the lead up to the 1972 Stockholm conference. And the Stockholm, which really significantly for the book, because we remember it as this landmark conference that changed international cooperation in the environment space. It wasn't meant to be that kind of conference. It was seen as a largely technical gathering. Um, the, the first head of this conference secretary was a director of studies, a Swiss engineer. Uh, and so, um, but, but as these disasters came and there was a, a a sense among many different actors internationally that environmental questions were actually more important and more widespread than realized, Stockholm ended up taking on more and more momentum and became this landmark conference. But it wasn't designed. It wasn't like countries set up Stockholm to be this big conference. It, it just kind of became that conference because of this uh, decentralized convergence of expectations that ended up occurring. Uh, and so that, uh, I guess, is, is, is a really great illustration of the type of the way these types of um, demonstration effects can end up uh, spurring uh, the arrival of temporal focal point. Um, about the role of of weaker and more vulnerable actors, I think I think one of the aspects of this is that is that these actors actually can, in in many cases, whether uh, uh, it's not necessarily the the power of the international actor that makes them more able to play a role in increasing the significance or uh, of uh, or the uh, the conspicuousness of a potential temporal focal point. Uh, instead, it's it's in a way they uh, it's it's just their ability, their entrepreneurship, perhaps their connections. Uh, so in both the case of Stockholm and actually of Rio, uh, one of the most compelling figures that we get in the book, if you if you read the empirical chapters, is Morris Strong, this, uh, the Canadian Secretary General. He had these tiny secretariats, but he was brilliant at uh, because of the web of connections that he had in the international development space, and he you know he he had this Rolodex, and he traveled the world, and he gave speeches, and he he used his 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 network connections effectively to really create and help make Stockholm alongside the. Uh, these environmental disasters that help create a favorable con the favorable conditions for the rise of a temporal focal point in Stockholm, um, he helped greatly amplify the conspicuousness of this. And it wasn't because of the resources. He was, uh, he was starved for resources. It was this tiny secretariat, but it was because of that entrepreneurial spirit in which he was able to, to bring, uh, to, to great, help uh, precipitate the convergence of expectations around the Stockholm Congress as a significant date. And so smaller, less well-resourced actors perhaps uh, are, are able uh, to, uh, to play their part in helping to increase the conspicuousness of a potential focal point. Um, how likely are we uh, to see progress on the SDGs? I think um, I think most of the reports, uh, and there have been a number out there that are suggesting that that we're way off target in terms of meeting the the global goals, uh, which uh, which I think is is as much a barometer of the state of international cooperation as anything right now. Um, and and these you know the seventeen goals are are so significant uh, in terms of a whole wide array of different areas of cooperation. Uh, whether the international community, you know, first with the pandemic, we are already behind before the pandemic, and then the pandemic set many of these uh, the indicators of these global goals uh, show that that really the progress is rolling back uh, back down the hill. Um, and now uh, the war in Ukraine, the the energy crisis, the food crisis, inflation, all these things I think are going to going to make it real uh, real tough to to realize progress on these global goals. Uh, I uh, I'm sad to say. Um, hopefully uh, we uh, we can regain the momentum of it, but I, I I suspect some of the momentum on these issues is is uh, is receded a little bit uh, since uh, since agreement was achieved on to to to, to on these uh, different goals. Um, so uh, sadly, I'm not. I'm not sure we're going to regain the momentum, at least in the immediate future. Thank you very much. And uh, unfortunately, I hate to end on a pessimistic note like I that, <laughs> <laughs> but it is all the time that we have for today. Um, but thank you so much for this tremendously rich presentation, um, and also a very insightful uh, discussing comments from Orfeo. I think this was a very interesting webinar, and um, congratulations to a, a great presentation. 
Um, I, before leaving you, I'd like to just let the audience know that we do have a webinar scheduled for next month uh, with Adam Dean on his new book, Opening Up by Cracking Down, Labor Repression and Trade Liberalization in Democratic Developing Countries. And as usual, you can register for that one at globe-project.eu, and you can also see our past episodes. So thank you very much, uh, Michael and Orfeo, for joining us today, and thank you to the audience also for participating, and hope to see you again very soon. Yeah, thank you very much, Carrie, and thank you, Orfeo, for the comments and, and to everybody in the audience for some really interesting comments. I just now opened up the Q&A box and I recognize uh, some of the names in there. So thank you for the, for the great questions. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll see all of you uh, very soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.